Bella Valerie, amen. God bless you. Amen. Bless God for y'all. Are y'all happy to be at church this morning? Yes. I just thank God um, for the fellowship of the saints. I thank God for that. It's a blessing um, to be amongst believers. It's a blessing to meet amongst family. It's a blessing um, to be in a place um, where you are able to hear the word of God. Um, God loves us so very much. And I am truly overwhelmed um, by his love today. What a blessing it has been to walk through the fruit of the Spirit these past months. What a blessing. I am always so grateful to God um, in his care for us. That's, that's how I receive the ministry of God. It's, you know, it, yes, it's instruction, and yes, it's knowledge, but it is care ministered to us. It is our Father speaking to us. He constantly teaches us through his word, building in us a better understanding of who he is and who we are in him. There are so many people that say, believers, you know, we, we, we follow blindly, that we don't know why we do what we do, that we don't really even know what we believe. But I'm so glad to say that the God we serve is not like that. We don't, he does not lead us blindly. Yes, we walk by faith, but we are not blind. Ah, good. That's good. Yes, we walk by faith and not by sight, but we are not blind that the God we serve takes time to instruct us, that the God we serve has given us apostles who hear him and heed his word to do and say what the Spirit directs. I thank God for that. It is a precious, precious gift. And this study of Galatians 5 has brought encouragement. It has brought relief. <laughs> It has brought correction and warning and affirmation, not only for this body of Christ, but has served those who we come in contact with every single day. The manifestation and work of the spirit in us and through us cannot be contained within us. But it is graciously and purposefully overflows to bless every single person God allows us to encounter. Peace is introduced to the person at the checkout counter. Joy is introduced to the person at the gas station. Patience is introduced to our family members. Self-control is introduced to our coworkers. Gentleness is introduced to the homeless person on the corner. Faithfulness is introduced to our friends. And through this teaching, God has purpose that we take hold of in a new way. What he has produced and is continuing to produce in us that we would have no doubt of who we are following, no doubt in why we do what we do, and no doubt in where our faith lies. And as we conclude this portion of our teaching, let's look back at our scripture reference to take in again all that God has said. Now, I'm going to do a bit of reading today. Like, I got, like, verse upon verse upon verse because I just love the word of God. Like, you got to get all of it so y'all can sit. Um, I know you're standing um, in, in, in your spirit out of respect for the word of God. So we're going to look at, again, Galatians 5, verses 13 through 26. And this is the NIV, Galatians 5, starting at verse 13 and going all the way to 26. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. 
So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the spirit, Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Galatians 5, 13 through 26, what we have been talking about for months. As Apostle Dorothy ministered last Sunday on the next harvest, God caught me with his direction concerning his people. Instead of sending them to the church. I'm sending them to you. Instead of sending them to the church, which is awesome. I mean, the church, we are the church. I mean, did y'all have fun at Harvest Fest last Sunday? I mean, church is awesome. But instead of sending them to the church, God said, I'm sending them to you. And as I thought about that level of trust God gives us with a soul, that level of responsibility, it is humbling, is it not? To say the least. That God, you, out of everything, out of of everything you can do, you decide to introduce your people to you through me. That you feel as though the best representation of who you are and what you are and what you're all about comes through me. And so, of course, through my mind is running, okay, you know, I have to make sure I have my peace in check. I have to make sure I've got my patience locked in. I've got to make sure that I am, I am demonstrating joy. And God encouraged me that the fruit The fruit of the spirit is singular. The fruit of the spirit is singular. It's not a multifaceted entity that we are grasping at bits and pieces of. I bless God that we walk through every aspect, but it's not as though we're rushing about trying to grab and and, and pick up and gosh, I've got to collect and collect, but rather it is a completeness in God that is produced in us and demonstrated in multiple ways. The fruit of the spirit is the wholeness of God at work in us. So we can see that the interconnectedness of peace and patience, how kindness flows into gentleness. God is saying, I'm not asking you out of all of this that you've learned. I'm not asking you to go out and start seeking and trying to find and trying to dig up and trying to pick. And No, I want you to be whole in me. I want you to turn yourself over to me that all of who I am can be demonstrated in you. And if we look at where this fruit starts, even as Apostle said, if we look at the root, if we consider, as Galatians 5.14 says, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
we would see that every aspect of the spirit in us begins and ends with love. Yes, love was mentioned first. Yes, love is listed first in this Galatians 5 text. But don't you see how God cares for us that he said, I'm going to tie all this up so that you can, you can just rest your mind and say, I'm not going to be going down trying to check off the lips of the fruits of the spirit. But if I get this fruit, if I understand this, If I understand love, then all of who God is will be shown and demonstrated in me. Love is what fuels our joy. It's what gives us peace. Love is what helps us to endure in patience and forgiveness. Love is what allows us to be kind. Love is what brings about goodness. Love causes us to be faithful. Love guides us in gentleness. And love holds us in self-control. And while love is so fundamental, it has become one of the most complex aspects of God to give to others and even to receive. People have a physical and emotional response to even hearing the word love. It causes something, it triggers something, a memory, a feeling, an emotion, because love has been misrepresented. It has been passed about counterfeit. It has been called something that it's not. It has been shrouded in something that is false. And so today, we will allow God to minister to us on what love is and what love is not. What love is and what love is not. And so we're we're gonna read another little bit of scripture, one of the most familiar. We're gonna go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 through 13. And so often we, you know, pass by like, oh yeah, you know, that I know that scripture. But we've heard it before. God says, listen again with new ears. Listen again for the first time. And just to give a little context, this text is a letter that Paul has written to the church at Corinth. And they are, you know, a group of believers, not unlike, you know, most of our churches today trying to do right, not quite getting there. And so Paul is pulling them in for instruction and correction. And this is a portion of his letter to them. So again, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 13, and we're gonna read from verses one through 13. I'm gonna turn in my big old Bible Everybody knows I'm extra, extra saved. (laughs) And so let's look at this text. 1 Corinthians 13. And again, we're looking at verses 1 through 13. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, 
always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let us pray. Lord God, we bless you for this time. God, we thank you, Father, for your spirit resting here with us. God, we purpose ourselves right now to receive all of what you have to say. God, give us fresh revelation from your word of what love is and how to demonstrate that to your people, God. Father, the word has already gone forth that we trust you. So even in this moment, God, we say we trust you. Instruct us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love is our most direct inherited trait of our Father. His likeness is seen best in us through our love. I'm going to say that again. Love is our most direct inherited trait of our Father. His likeness is seen best in us through our loves. The Bible says God is love. And so that right there dispels any issue we have with, you know, I'm not lovable. I'm not a loving person. I'm not this. I'm not that. Actually, you are most like God in your love. You know how someone says, oh, you look, you look just like your mama, just like your daddy. When people see you, the thing that should pop off the most is, man, you are just, you're just so, you're so loving. You say, oh, yep, just like my daddy. That is your most direct inherited trait of your father. Now, we use the 1 Corinthians 13 text in marriage ceremonies and marriage seminars. All the married people are like, we have heard this a million times, but... This isn't explaining the love between a husband and a wife. We said in the beginning that this letter was sent to an entire church body. This had nothing to do with husbands and wives. While it can be applied, it is not exclusive. Paul wrote this to brothers and sisters. This is the love believers are to demonstrate towards others. And as we read it, as we look at, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love never fails, it always hopes, it always believes, it always protects. Who does that sound like? I could say to myself, well, I fail all the time, and, you know, I do get angry, and I do. It is describing an aspect of something that I am to take hold of, a trait of someone who demonstrates this all the time. This is describing Jesus. This is describing God. This is describing Holy Spirit. So then this is what my life is to look like. This is the ministry of Jesus Christ at work within me, within us. Love is 
the salvation of Christ best manifested in our lives and the proper delivery of the invitation for others to know him. Love is the salvation of Christ best manifested in our lives and the proper delivery of the invitation for others to know him. No one ever came to Christ because they lost the argument. No one has ever come to God because they have lost a fight or were simply convinced of the facts. So much can be proven by science and DNA and all that stuff. And, you know, we've, we've all seen the case for Christ and we've gone through all that and, you know, read all the articles and such. The catalyst for a heart change comes when the revelation of God's love is made real to a person. The catalyst for a heart change comes when the revelation of God's love is made real. There is no denying real love. Real love changes you. Real love changed all of us. If you sit and think, what, what was it that caused me to accept Christ? Yes, our grandmothers brought us to church every single Sunday. Yes, we, we memorize all the Bible verses. Yes, we watch the women shout in church. But that isn't what did it. That isn't what got us out of our seat. That isn't what made us go to the, the new members class. It isn't what hired us to come up and stand at the altar. It isn't what had us get in line for the baptism. It was the love of God made real to us. And it wasn't always happening from a sermon. It wasn't always happening in youth group. Sometimes it was just right in our room. At some point, we caught hold of God loves me. Whether it was, you know, I, I've sinned so bad, Lord, and yet you still want me. Whether it was, you know, something terrible has happened, but God, you've covered me. It was the revelation of God's love that brought about the change. God expressed himself first to us in love, sending Jesus in the form of a baby. He could have drawn us with power. He could have drawn us with might, but he chose to draw us first with his love. And that is how we draw others. God could have done anything. He could have knocked the whole world. He, he could have done anything. But how did he send his son? He sent him in the form of a baby that we could recognize the tenderness, the closeness, the nearness. That's how he's ministered to us all along. The enemy has perpetuated a lie that believers are one of the most unloving groups of people. The book Unchristian by David Kinnaman is based on years of research by the Barna Group and is aimed at how Christians are perceived by those outside the church. And now some would say it doesn't matter how the world sees us because we are set apart, right? We are sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what they say. They're the ones that need fixing because obviously we are already fixed. This is, how, this is how the world sees us. And all of that is true for the most part. Um, you know, we, we're still being refined. We're still being purified and sanctified and all that. But unfortunately, the characteristics that are setting us apart are not the ones that mark Jesus and his first disciples. Jesus was criticized for the love and compassion he showed to those who were considered unreachable by the religious leaders of his day. Yes, yes. The radicalness, as Pastor as Apostle Lawrence sang, of his love to touch those who were considered unclean, to sit with those who had stolen and lied, to protect those who were caught in adultery, to show concern for those who were shunned by their communities. In biblical times, followers of Christ were known as the most loving and open people in history. The most loving, the most open people in history. People could not believe 
that Jesus would want to be near them. People, they, they were afraid. Zacchaeus was in a tree. Like, I just want to see him. The woman with the issue of blood, if I could just reach the hem of his garment, like, I know I'm not, I'm not pure, I'm not clean, whatever. People were shocked and amazed that this man who lived a holy life cared enough to reach out to them. The true kingdom of God was thought to be upside down because the least was considered the greatest. It changed the whole world. No other faith was like this. No other experience was like this. And the, 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 the defining factor was love. Do you know what characteristics believers are most known for today? Now, Justin, I haven't even given them yet. But if we look at the description I just gave, the most loving, the most open, would you even describe believers as that way today? The top six descriptors for Christians in the world today are hypocritical, judgmental, too focused on getting converts, sheltered, anti-homosexual, too political. The people we are hoping to reach for Christ, the people God loves so much and wants to be drawn to him, see this. Hypocrisy, judgment, sheltered and separated. How incredibly ironic that the description of Jesus and his followers 2,000 years ago does not match the description of Jesus and his followers now. What has happened? What has happened? We are to be the most loving, the most open, the most caring. Elder Nebron and I were talking about this yesterday. We don't have to fellowship and, and be in, in agreement with darkness, but goodness gracious, people who are in darkness are afraid to come near us. That is so the opposite of what our Father has given us, the imprint that he has left on us, the, our identity in Christ. That is not who we are. And for those who can say, well, the world is lying. They are lying. You know, facts are facts. And if a, if a person has to cringe at the, the, at the mention, we, we, we now say believer instead of Christian because when you say Christian, people are like, wait a minute. I don't want none of that. Believer sounds a little bit more. And we have accustomed and, 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 and grown in that because of this issue of love, because of this misrepresentation of who we are. In order for us to produce what the Spirit wants to grow in us, in order to demonstrate, as we, as we have described, the fullness of God in the fruit of the Spirit, we must first understand and walk in love. To know what love is and what love is not. We have to know the difference. And while these points that we're going to go over are not exhaustive, it is a good place to start in being aware of how love is to be manifested in us. So three things we're going to get to look at today. Love is carried out with grace. Love is not performance-based. Love is carried out with grace. Love is not performance-based. Love is giving based on the spirit. Love is not used to pacify. Love is giving based on the spirit. 
Love is not used to pacify. Love is a decision in action. Love is not emotionally driven. Love is a decision in action. Love is not emotionally driven. So first, love is carried out with grace. Love is not performance-based. 1 John 4 and 10 says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus being sent to us had nothing to do with what we deserved or what we earned. Jesus being sent to us had nothing to do with what we deserved or what we earned. Jesus himself did not even select his disciples based on their upright living or reputations. He grabs up some rough brothers. I mean, who had some issues, deep-seated issues, anger issues, parental issues, competition issues. But he said, it doesn't matter. I'm coming to you because I love you and there's something you can do in this kingdom. Every encounter of God's love experienced by his people has never and will never be earned. Thank God for that. Every encounter of God's love, every encounter of God's love towards you, you will never, ever, ever earn it and you will never be asked to. You will never, ever, ever be able to work enough towards it, and you will never be asked to. My, my, my. That's good. That's and in as much as we are modeling our lives by the Spirit, our love is to be given in the same manner, full of grace, given not by what is earned, but because of who God is and the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit within us. Now, I've got to remind you again, because I see some people, I feel in the spirits of people's minds are drifting. I was like, I'm not showing love. Da, 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 da. We have to remember what 1 Corinthians said. I'm not talking about some emotional flinging. I'm talking about the spirit of love. I'm talking about what was commanded amongst brothers and sisters. People should not feel condemned by the so-called love we show. Conviction may come, but that should not be the motivation. Unfortunately, so often in our church communities, love was used as a condemning factor. I love you, so I'm gonna help you cover up this short dress. I love you, so you're gonna sit in the back of the church because you made too big of a mistake. We love you, so we're going to call you out front so you can testify of what you did. And the church is going to support you. I love you so. I love you so. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to treat you. And it has demolished the true spirit of love within us. Conviction may come through how I love you but it should not be condemnation. And there is a difference. We know it, you know, you know it. When you say something and it's right, but that's not right. We know it when we pass something and it's good, but that's not good. The spirit will identify that thing. Let's decide, let's decide, even, even before we go on through the rest of these points, let's decide right now, we're just going to put that aside. It doesn't benefit nobody. It doesn't really make any of us feel any better if we put somebody, it, it doesn't help anybody. Let's show real love. I, I've got a story. So um, we have three kids, y'all. You guys know that. I'm just saying that we have three kids. I'm saying to the people online, we have three children. And each of them only do one thing, one activity. But do you know it runs me ragged trying to get everybody to every place and everything. And I don't know if it was last week. I think it was a week before. Um, one of our kids' coaches decided to 
out of practice to the week. How many parents know you cannot add a practice? Like, no, no, no. You can take away. Do not add. And this coach, I'm preaching now, I know. This coach added a practice. Lord, have mercy. I get home. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I am actually a part-time Uber driver. I just don't get paid for it. I am running all around <laughs> Suffolk, up and down streets. At, I mean, for like five, five, six hours straight. And I, I'm trying to get the stuff together because, you know, when I have my child part of the team, yes, we're dedicated and he loves it. And my husband calls me in the midst of scrambling around. And I promise you, the instant he says hello, I just, I just let him have it. I was like, I can't take it. This is tearing me bananas. Da, da, da. I mean, I'm just going. I'm going. And in the minutes, midst of it, I pause for a second and say, I'm so sorry. But I just have to, ah, and I just keep going, 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 going. And I mean, he's trying to get home from work, coming through the tunnel and everything. And his response was, I'm sorry, it's a hard day, but I just wanted to get to tell you I love you, and I'm on my way home. And I said, oh God, <laughs> I'm a terrible person. What caught me in that was that it was love given with grace. A whole bunch else could have been said, but it was love extended. And that is what God is looking for us to do and to give. We know stuff is crazy. People don't act right. You know, they, they don't. They get attitudes when they shouldn't. We get attitudes when we shouldn't. But this is the spirit of God. That in the midst of all of that, I have a foundation and an anchor. I have the fruits of the Spirit. I have the fruit of the Spirit. God has manifested in me. The completeness of God is made whole in me. And so I can minister love and let that be that. My whole attitude was changed. I said, oh, my God, okay. Thank you. All I could say was, Thank you so much. I'm going to finish packing um, his bag and I'll be good. In those minutes and that hour that passed, someone who was highly stressed was so grateful that the love of God was ministered to me. To where I said, you know, and yes, we, this, this is a husband and wife relationship, but even amongst friends to say, you know, just thank you for giving me a second. Um, I appreciate that. That's how we minister to one another. Love given with grace is so, 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 so pleasing to God. Oh, it makes him smile because it reminds him of what he did for us. It says, oh, my goodness, yes, you are, you are showing, you are my child, yes. Yes, that is what I did for you. It is so pleasing to God. Yes, it, it, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But I'm telling you, God is so pleased when you show love. God is so pleased when you're able to manifest that. God is so grateful. He is like, oh, my goodness, everything we did. Look, this one moment to show love. Don't worry about how right someone is. Don't worry about whether or not they've earned it. The fruit of the Spirit in us isn't controlled by outside factors. We're claiming the fruit of the Spirit in us, so that is what is going to flow out of us. Someone's attitude doesn't have enough power to stop the love of God. Someone's situation doesn't have enough influence to stop the love of God from flowing out of me. Amen. Amen. That is a revelation. My love is not just an emotion or just a thing. It is the demonstration of God's power within me. You don't have enough anything to cause me not to show you love. This is the fruit of the spirit. I, it can't be shut down by 
you know, you rolling your eyes, anything. No, this is the power of God inside of me. Love is carried out with grace. Love is not performance-based. Number two, love is giving based on the spirit. Love is not used to pacify. Love is giving based on the spirit. Love is not used to pacify. We give of our resources, our time, our energy, and our hearts as the Spirit directs. We give of our resources, our time, our energy, and our hearts as the Spirit directs. When we give as the Spirit directs and not based on people's expectations, people's ideas, or any spirit of guilt or shame, the fear that can be associated with giving is cast off. And so this is an area of love that people suffer from because they say, well, you know, there were so many instances that I gave, that I I opened up and I was disappointed. I was hurt. I was taken advantage of. And in no way, in no way, do we blame anyone for hurt or trauma that they have experienced. This is instruction to help because regardless of what the past may hold, God still needs us to love. So we might as well learn how to do it. We might as well learn how to go on. And so to know that my love is not to keep you quiet, my love is not to get you off my back, My love is not to cover something up. Counterfeit love is so prevalent. This is why when people are able to encounter real love, the love of the spirit, the fruit of love in you, it is so life-changing. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. That says a lot right there. Right there my if I'm afraid of this, if I, it's not that, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I have it or not sure. Like, if I feel fear, then that is not love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Fear has to do with manipulation. Fear has to do with, with, with being taken advantage of. Fear has to do with that. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And that does not mean that because you're afraid you're not, you don't know what love is. That means that there is not a completeness in that. There isn't, there isn't a washing of God's spirit in that. That, that, that this, this is not what you should be doing. This means that the fruit of love we show is not based on manipulation, but it's based on the spirit. The fruit of love we show is not to keep anyone quiet, but to build a true testimony of God's goodness. The fruit of love we show is not to cause harm, but is to encourage our own hearts because Jesus has already taken the burden of harm mentally, emotionally, and spiritually upon himself and rose victorious over all. Love is not supposed to hurt you and it is not supposed to hurt anyone else. Jesus already took all that. He took the abuse. He took the misuse. He took the embarrassment. He took the ridicule. He took the shame. That is not what love is to feel like for you. And that is not the love that you are to give away. Love is living with an openness that is not hindered by the fear of people or the fear of giving more than what is received. There's a freeness in love. There's a, you know, I'm not really worried about it in love. There's a, it's okay, I got it in love. Love is 
easy. Love is free. Love is to flow. God didn't give you this spirit, this fruit, for it to be hard, as Apostle Lawrence was saying. And it's funny because that is not what we are accustomed to hearing or thinking about love. We say, you know, love is hard, it takes work, and you gotta, oh, oh, oh. That's actually not how it's supposed to be. We live in a fallen world, and so, you know, it's not exactly what God intended but we're able to manifest and flow in this. We're able to rise above and operate in the fruit of the spirit. Love is being able to hear what God is saying in regards to ourselves and others and walking that out however it looks. And so this frees us also when we think of love as giving directed by the spirit. Sometimes God says, no, don't do that. Sometimes God says, do that. If God says, no, don't do that, and we do it anyway, then that is not love because that is pacifying. God says, that's not what love is. We've got to flow in what God is saying. So first, love is carried out with grace. Love is not performance-based. Love is giving based on the spirit. Love is not used to pacify. And the third thing we're going to look at for the purposes of today, love is a decision in action. Love is not emotionally driven. Love is a decision in action. Love is not, as much as we would like to think, emotionally driven. 1 John 4.19 says, We love because he first loved us, period. We love because he first loved us. And there is literally a period at the end of that verse. That is it. We don't love because we feel loved. We don't love because we feel like loving. We don't love because we want love in return. We are able and empowered to love because he first loved us. This is not just an emotion, but a gifting of the spirit. Love is a gifting of the spirit. I am gifted with love. You are gifted with love. And so in the truth of God's unfailing, all-encompassing, all-powerful love, I am able with the mind of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit to make a decision to show love when I feel like it or not. Whether I'm having a good day or not. Whether I'm sad or not. Whether I'm angry or not. I have a mind and a spirit to love that is not tethered to my emotions. I have a mind, you have a mind and a spirit to love that is not tethered to your emotions. It's not tethered to what I feel because that changes so much. It's not tethered to that. Thanks be to God. This is why we say this is a fruit of the spirit. It's not not a, 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 a side idea of ours. It's not just a thing. It is the demonstration and manifestation of God. God is not bound by our emotions. God does not determine his his characteristics and spirit based on how we feel. And so love, being one of his characteristics, does not have anything to do with what I'm thinking or feeling. And so when love is needed, love is provided. When I open my mouth, love is going to be what comes out of it. We demonstrate the fruit of love in big gestures, Big things like giving tons of money, giving someone a place to stay, 
sacrificing something we want for the betterment of someone else, but we also show the fruit of love in small things, like greeting someone with a sincere hug, like listening to someone tell the very long story of their day, for holding the door open for someone and saying you're welcome genuinely, not like, yeah, you're welcome, like hurry up. This is how we demonstrate love. So in conclusion, in conclusion, we're gonna wrap this up. Love is what fuels our joy. It's what gives us peace. Love is what helps us to endure in patience and forgiveness. Love is what allows us to be kind. Love is what brings about goodness. Love causes us to be faithful. Love guides us in gentleness and love holds us in self-control. Love is our most direct inherited trait of our Father. His likeness is seen best in you through your love. And in that, love is carried out with grace. Love is not performance-based. Love is giving based on the spirit. Love is not used to pacify. Love is a decision in action. Love is not emotionally driven. And I encourage you, I encourage you, I encourage you online, I encourage you here in the sanctuary. Continue asking God, what is love and what is it not? Study that, look at that, talk to God about that. What is love? And I assure you the list can go on and on and on of what love is and what it is not. This blessing comes in Ephesians 3.17. I speak this over our online community. I speak this over you. Ephesians 3.17 says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father God, we bless you for your goodness and your mercy. God, we thank you for instructing us yet again in your love. God, we receive your word today. We receive your word. And God, in every aspect, in every place where we are not filled, where we do not understand, where we are still questioning what love is, Lord, we ask that you minister to that. God, we ask that you speak to us, God, in all the ways that you grasp and, and get our attention, Lord. Minister this gift to us. Minister this fruit to us. Minister this manifestation to us that we and your people and your kingdom would be blessed. God, we thank you for your love. Jesus, we thank you for your love. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your love. And we receive it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To our online community, thank you so much for being with us. We pray the peace of God over you. We pray the spirit of God over you. Be blessed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus